getting an agent is almost as hard or even harder than getting a publisher. Do you believe it? So many authors have told me that. That's because publishing companies use agents as their gatekeepers, as their filters. So if the agent says it's good, then the publisher just might talk to you. But if you try to get to the publisher without an agent, you may never get through the front door. Today, you're gonna to learn how to work with an agent, the do's and don'ts, what's new in the publishing industry, and how to make it as a successful author, and whether you need to have an agent or whether you should self-publish or go to the traditional route. Hi, I'm Dan Janelle, the author of more than a dozen books. I'm a ghostwriter, developmental editor, and book coach. I'm happy to help you create your books or refer you to people who can help you write your books. And today, let's get started. I'm pleased to introduce our super agent, Ken Lazat. Ken, how are you today? I'm very good. Thanks for having me here. Great. Ken, why don't you tell uh, people a little bit about your incredible background? Well, let me, let me first uh, give you my elevator pitch, as they call it, and that is um, Ken Lazat. I am uh, a CIO, which is Chief Imaginative Officer of Emerson Consulting Group in Concord, Massachusetts, and I make my clients famous. And the way I do that, you do that too, Jan, Dan, by the way, but um, the way I do that is I help them get published primarily. I help them uh, position themselves as thought leaders. And in my, uh, in my uh, sense of what a, a true thought leader is, it's someone with the credibility that comes with a book, or if you really can't handle writing a book, write at least articles and get them published. Publishing your ideas, that's the key. Um, but books are my main service and the reason is that um, I've always had books in my life, not, not just reading them. But uh, when I was younger, that was my biggest goal in life. My biggest professional goal was to write and publish a book. And um, I was lucky enough after, uh, I don't know, a year or two, or two um, spending time with other writers in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where I lived when I was younger, um, to run into a, a literary agent. And that literary agent uh, was there. He was networking with writers because he was starting an agency and he wanted to get some writers and get some projects and, uh, and be successful. Um, uh, I, I used to kind of try to vie for his attention and he didn't seem to pay much attention to me. But uh, one day I walked in early and he was the only one there. And he told me he was sitting with a book proposal that had just been offered a $50,000 advance from a top publisher in New York. It was G.P. Putnam's Sons. And the book, uh, unfortunately, couldn't be written because it needed a ghostwriter. And uh, he knew I could write, and he asked me to do it. The book was called High Inside, Memoirs of a Baseball Wife. And it was a behind-the-scenes look at Major League Baseball from a wife's point of view. Never had been a book like that. This is the early 80s. And um, I went on to get the job to do that. And uh, the book did come out and the book got a lot of fanfare and publicity and did fairly well. And from there, I was off and running. The main thing, though, uh, was that from that experience, I got to know this uh, agent, Mike, whose name was Mike, and he took me under his wing. And uh, he we, we would go, go down. We're in the Boston area. And we would drive down to New York City and he would go from publishing house to publishing house and take me with with him and meet all these uh, editors and, you know, got a chance to really learn the business. So uh, flat, uh, fast, fast forward about 20 years or so, I decided that uh, uh, I was spending a lot of time with management consultants uh, in the a professional uh, organization for them. And uh, I was hearing that they wanted to publish their ideas, but did not know how to, how to go about it. But they knew I did because they asked me to sit on a panel and talk about it. And uh, within, um, within two weeks of being on that panel, three or four of the uh, consultants came out of the woodwork and asked me to work with them. And off I was running with a, a whole new business, which was 25 years ago, and I'm, it's still going strong. Fantastic. What kind of clients do you work with? What kind of authors do you work with? 
Well, co consultants uh, remain uh, a very important client for me to work with. Uh, most of my book projects are business books. And um, I, uh, uh, I find that uh, uh, consultants are, are people who stock and trade uh, our ideas. They have to come up with ideas and strategies and coaching and different things uh, with their client companies and CEOs that they work with. So uh, they see the value in getting a book published. And, uh, and so they've become a natural audience for me right from the start and continue to be so. Um, but business people are primarily uh, what, I, what works for me in terms of a partnership because they, they, they just see the value of it and, and they can pay me for my services as well. A lot of consultants are publishing their own books. Do you recommend that they publish their own books or is there a market among publishers? Do publishers really want to work with consultants these days? Right. Well, um, publishers want to work with any potential author that has an idea for a book that the publisher believes will sell books. Um, that means that the publisher will be, will be in, in, uh, attracted to an idea for a book. Uh, but the second thing that's very important that they look at right away once they're attracted to an idea is whether or not the author can promote the book. That's really, really important. And a lot of people, the biggest misconception that I find people have about uh, book publishers is the idea that book publishers will promote your book, that it will give you an advantage. And the answer to that is, the response I have to that is not at all. In fact, it's just the opposite. Publishers want you to have a fantastic idea that, that could be, and nobody knows for sure, but could be saleable. They want you to have a, uh, an aggressive uh, book promotion uh, plan, and they want you to effect it. In other words, they don't want you to just say, well, I'm willing to go out and speak. I'm a very good speaker. Publisher gets them speaking engagements, and that's, that's great. No, the publisher does not want to do that. The publisher does not want to really do much of anything. So the publisher is attracted to the book promotion plan. Now, you're asking about self-publishing. Here's what happens if you self-publish. If you don't want to even promote your book, you don't have to, because you're the publisher. <laughs> you can let yourself off the hook. The, uh, the, the biggest um, uh, conversation that I have in the beginning, when I, when I meet someone or someone comes my way in terms of um, um, potentially being a client of mine, is, is, is to get, uh, uh, get some knowledge about this question of these two options. There are two options for getting a book published. One is to have a publisher, the, or the other is to self-publish. Self-publishing used to be a horrible way to go because the only way you could really do it in the old days, meaning over 20 years ago, 25 years ago, is that uh, you went to what's called a vanity press and they often did shoddy work uh, and it was, the book didn't look good and the book didn't real read good or any of that. Um, or you did it yourself and you drove yourself crazy because you had all these various aspects of it that you had to do yourself and suddenly become expert in or hire people for this and that and this. So it was terrible, but it has changed in the last 20, 25 years with print on demand technology. And, and the Amazon service and, and some of the other services that are out there. So that um, all of these uh, aspects of a publisher, what a publisher normally do does, uh, can be handled um, expertly. So, uh, so what does that mean? It means that if you want, uh, if you really want uh, to have a publisher and some people, I can try to make the case against publishing. I can try, I can make it real easy when you think about the logic of it. But most people who come to me still want a publisher. And the reason is 
down deep, they just want some validation for their ideas. They want to know that some some third party ent entity, some expert publishing house, would give them, you know, the uh, imprimatur on their books, on their book idea. So uh, that's not really a practical, logical um, um, choice to make, but it, it is an emotional one that causes people to want to have a publisher. Some people, though, look at it differently. They can see right away that that's not enough and they don't feel they need that personal validation or any of that. So they choose the self-publishing route. And, and now either one that you, that you choose um, will cause a, a different a, a set of events, depending on which one you choose. If you decide you want a publisher, you must then not write the book, but compose a book proposal. The publishers do not want to see your finished book. They want to see a proposal. What's the proposal? It's the synopsis of the book. It's you and your background. It's a table of contents. It's um, maybe a sample chapter. Um, and it's the all important book promotion campaign. I can't emphasize that enough. That's the most important thing um, of, in the whole proposal, really. So you got to be willing to play that game if you want um, a publisher, the game of promoting the hell out of that book. But if you decide to go uh, the self-publishing route, finally getting back and, here. And, and I'm sorry, let me stop you there because we have a limited amount of time. Let's focus completely on the publishing route because I've done other episodes on self-publishing uh, and that's okay. Oh, okay. So let's talk about how do you find an agent and what is an agent looking for? Okay, I, I, I'm, go, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna finish what I was gonna say with one line though, because that's where I was going. If you go the self-publishing route, all you have to do is write and have the thing edited or edit it yourself or whatever, and that's it. You work on the book. So um, I was fixating on that, so, so let me have the question again, Dan. Sure. How, how would someone find an agent? What is an agent looking for from an author? Okay. Well, f uh, finding agents to um, pitch to is fairly easy. There are directories that one can purchase or find at a library. If you go on Amazon, you can find a uh, directory of literary agents, and it's got agent, you know, hundreds and hundreds of agents there, and, it, and uh, it'll describe what uh, the agent is looking for, uh, and, um, and you can send an email, make your pitch. Um, what was the second half of the question? Uh, how can you make yourself attractive to an agent? Oh yeah, okay. So uh, everything I just said is how you make yourself attractive because an agent, in order to, to, to make a living, an agent needs to function exactly like a publisher. They've got to make the publishers as happy as possible. So if I'm an agent uh, of that sort, um, where my uh, compensation depends on uh, a, a percentage of royalties and uh, advance and, and those kinds of compensations that are going to come from a publisher, I've got to give the publisher just what it wants. And what it wants is everything I just said. It wants a proposal and it wants, um, it wants a very strong uh, author or book promotion plan. And uh, if you, if you uh, create that and you're able to make a commitment to that, and that's in the proposal, that's going to get the attention of an agent. Um, that, that's, that's kind of the problem with it, is, is that agents and publisher are kind of the same in terms of how you attract them. Will the agent actually help you write the proposal or comment or critique a proposal that you've written? Us. Well, some will. Some will and some won't. Um, it depends. With you. <laughs> Yeah, I do. Uh, in fact, that's that's what my service does immediately is uh, is to say, OK, you, we've had this discussion about which option to take. You want to have a publisher. Let's start working on the proposal. I would prefer actually to start from scratch, although it, it, some people do a really fine job with proposals I've seen. Um, but um, but there are always holes. And in fact, I, I have a prospective client right now that I just contact or uh, res responded to today. 
And um, they, she and her co-author put together a very, very, very nice proposal, except for one piece that was missing. You know what that was? The marketing plan. The, the promotion plan. How many times do I need to say it? <laughs> and it w- just wasn't even there. Everything else was there, but not there. So um, I definitely work uh, hand in hand with clients and some on proposals and some uh, 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 agents do as well. But you know, for those, if you happen to be hooking up with an agent that doesn't, like I said, there's um, just like there's a directory of agents, there's also books that will that will lead you through the process of how to how to do a, a, a proposal. Sure. And I've also seen websites from literary agencies where they will tell you exactly who their agents are, what genres they're looking for, and you can have fill in the blank questionnaires or proposals online to fill out as well. So right. that's something that listeners should look to as well. Uh, one, of my, right. uh, one, one of my listeners uh, actually asked a few questions in advance. So let's get to a few of those. Uh, first, sure. how are you compensated? Or how so are most comp- agents compensated? Well, okay, I'm different than most agents. I, I am compensated with a, with a consulting fee or a project fee. So, and, and what that is depends on the, on the actual, um, you know, the, the scope of the project. But uh, I, I, my fee also covers some promotion and it covers, uh, it might cover some editing, although uh, I'm always uh, happy to partner with editors like yourself or some of, I know a couple of your other people in your mastermind group. Um, because uh, those of you that do that kind of work are just very, usually very, very uh, competent and, and excellent at it. it you, you throw yourself into it. Um, but, uh, but sometimes uh, I don't have someone to help with that. So I either supply an edit, editor or a ghostwriter. Um, but that's not the main thing. The main thing is, is to propose, the proposal comes first. And um, and then uh, my shopping around the, the proposal to publishers, looking for a publisher. In the meantime, if my client wants to get to work on writing the thing, that's fine too. And uh, and then and then once the book comes out, I just one of my clients just officially um, had his book published yesterday, and I had him I had him on a podcast, and I'm going to be setting him up for some book promotion uh, activities, which were put into the proposal. See. So I'm an all in all in one shop in a lot of ways. That's what's different. What most agents though, they don't do any any of that. They they just they want to have a proposal and they'll ask you very often to put your proposal together yourself. And uh, they may or may not that may or may not convince them. But if it does, then uh, they will be shopping your proposal around. Their compensation is typically 15, 10 or 15 percent of um, of royalties and uh, or advances or other compensation, but understand something about that that model. It's it's it, to me it's a weird model that's left over from hundreds of years of of just uh, tradition. Um, what you're asking an agent to do by not directly compensating him or her is to wait for money that may never come. And um, uh, so what that means is that the 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 agent tends to uh, look only at the top publishers that pay the big um, uh, fees, the big advances in royalties. And there aren't that many of them. There used to be 20 or 30 of them. Now they're all with all the uh, uh, conglomeration that's taken place. There aren't that many of them. There's five or six or seven. So when I first started this business, I used to partner with uh, uh, successful New York City uh, literary agents. And and every time, every time they let me down, every time, I, after like um, six, seven or eight, I finally had to give up on that. I just said, that, look, this is about failure. I, I can do that. I'm good at that too. So, uh, but the reason is they could, they, they got very excited about a project and then they went to the four or five publishers that they thought would go for it and they, the publisher didn't go for it. So now there's no incentive for the uh, agent to keep going, because if they go to the middle tier or the lower tier, there isn't gonna be much or any money coming their way unless the book becomes a blockbuster bestseller. And that's why I say agents are just like publishers. They're all looking for the blockbuster bestseller 
93% of books that are published fail to sell even uh, 1,000 books in the book's lifetime. 93% of all books that are published, self-publish or publisher, publish. So how do, they, how, how do they make a living? How do publishers stay in business? They do it by having maybe a textbook in their list or uh, uh, some sort of a, an ongoing series. Uh, some of you may have heard of uh, Harry, the Harry Potter series. <laughs> well, you know, that was, a, that was a great boon to Bloomsbury Press to have that walk in. Not that they thought they were going to sell that, that, that many books for that many years and movies and everything else. But that's what they hope and pray for. I'm wondering, is there a litmus test on how many followers of an author must have for a publisher to take them seriously? Uh, um, the, the, there's no, there's no like cutoff that I've seen because it depends on the publisher. Some, some are, some for some. If you have, um, let's say, uh, a thousand Twitter followers, um, some publisher on a sort of medium, uh, middle, or, or lower level might say, "That's great. That's that's good. Really good." But uh, if you go to a, a random house, for example, they're going to probably want uh, 50, 60, 70,000 uh, Twitter followers. So it all depends, you know. The bigger, the better name publishers are the ones with the higher overhead and uh, the, the, the bigger profits they need to make and all of that. So they're going to expect more. I'll tell you what, what is um, a very uh, valuable thing to be or to do uh, if you, if you want to you want to get a good publishing deal. And that is um, that if you are a speaker, now we're talking in a time of we're just coming out of uh, lockdown and it's, you know, virtual like the Zoom, like Zoom and, and all. But um, traditionally, those who speak and they speak 50, 60, 100 times a year, they can almost write their own ticket because they're going to be selling books every time they leave the house. So um, publishers really like that. They, they've always found age-old uh, uh, public speaking as being um, the strongest marketing of a book that one can do, short of being already very, very famous. You know, if you've got a very famous name, somebody, if people know about you, uh, then it, you, you're going to be seen on the Today Show and, uh, and everywhere else. Well, that's good news for a lot of people listening because they are speakers. <laughs> so that's, well, that's very yeah. encouraging. Uh, you know, really, yeah. I, I've heard of this other publishing model. So let's talk about publishing, I would say scams, but things to watch out for if you do get a publishing contract. Um, for instance, there are some publishing companies that I've heard of that have adopted what they call the shared risk model. And by shared risk, they mean yeah, that yeah. they'll be happy to publish your book if you agree to buy 5,000 copies at $7 a piece. Yeah. In other words, mm -hmm. you're paying them $35,000 to proofread, copy, edit, and lay out your book and not do much else. Uh, mm -hmm. Some people think that's a good deal <laughs> just to have a brand name on the spine of their book. I'm curious what you think of that model and if there are any variations on that model that are just simply ripoffs, because I know you mentioned the Vanity Press in the beginning. Uh, are there any modern day equivalents of Vanity Press where you're really not getting your money's worth? Two questions, I'll remind you of them. Okay, um, so yeah, this, this, this idea of um, purchasing books came to me through an editor at Wiley about 10 or 12 years ago. That's when I, I first encountered it. And he said, uh, he said, you know, we might be interested in publishing your client's books. He said, might, might be interested if um, he was willing to purchase 5,000 hardcover copies. He said, we'll give you, we'll give him the, uh, the author's discount of 50%. Um, but that still was like $15 per book. And they had to buy them all at once when the book was officially uh, published. Um, uh, that's you do the math. It's like seventy five thousand bucks or something like that, just to have Wiley on the spine of your book. Forbes uh, has a publishing house that even goes beyond that. It can can cost about two hundred thousand just to have be a Forbes book. But um, I have had some of those deals that I have um, I've negotiated, but 
I never, I never want my, my individual client to be responsible for paying all of that. So I had, uh, I had, I helped them arrange, uh, the, uh, one of them worked for a, a, a large, uh, a training company that was willing to purchase the books and another one worked as a consultant for international paper and they were willing to purchase the books but i would never recommend that just somebody just have 5000 copies of a book uh, out of their own pocket um it's it, you're not going to be able to get rid of them probably that's going to be some of the biggest thing let alone the money that it costs but it it does blur the line uh, from self around self publishing and, uh, and the smaller publishers now are catching on to this too. And while they won't ask for 5,000 copies, they might be delighted if you'll purchase 200 copies, but it, 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 it's, it helps them um, meet, their, uh, um, meet their expenses. And that's as much as anything what uh, some of them are trying to do. It's almost as if, there's, as if you're self-publishing through someone else. Uh, you're, you're letting them do all the heavy work of the copy editing and proofreading and uh, all the production issues and you're paying them the fee and you're getting your books and not much else. Yeah. Uh, let's turn to a question from the audience. Um, I figure the answer is it depends. I realize a lot of questions. <laughs> it, it often is the answer. Uh, let, let's go for it. Would a literary agent consider representing a nonfiction writer with a particularly narrow niche, but one with a very little competition? So that goes against the question of they want a big market with a lot of promotion. What about something that is hot in a small market? I could see that the answer would be yes. But again, it's got to be coupled with the author um, laying out a very strong uh, book promotion plan and um, having um, ha uh, uh, the, comp the, the publisher has confidence that this uh, person is going to really uh, enact that plan. Because if, if you're really going out there, you've got some sort of narrow niche that there's no one else out there, then it's a matter of getting the word out to those people who might be interested in learning from the book and they wouldn't have anywhere else to go. They'd go on Amazon and it's not, it's not there. Nothing else is there. Um, so you'd be the only, only um, product, uh, you know, available. So I could see that, but it's still, it's a requirement that, the author have a very strong uh, author promotion plan. Great. Uh, Follow-up question. Would it make economic sense to have a literary agent rather than go the self-publishing route when the niche is narrow and it's the consultancy fees that will bring in the real income? In other words, a lot of our listeners are consultants. Should they even consider working with an agent or should they just self-publish? From a logical point of view, it makes sense to self-publish. From, from purely law. In fact, going back to what I said about speakers, yeah, pu publishers would fall all over themselves if you're if you're a speaker uh, with let's say 100 gigs a, a, a year and there's 5,000 people in your audience and all of that. But then again, maybe it makes more sense for you not to have a publisher because then the back of the room sales you're going to have higher profit from those books that you sell. So that's the question: is whether or not it really makes any sense. Um, from a logical point of view, and you know, I would say in this case, no. Fantastic, thank you. G given the fact that you make your money by representing authors, that's a very honest answer. So I appreciate your you're not self dealing. That's uh, very very nice of you. Uh, are there any other questions from the audience members? I'll open up the phone lines and or the Zoom lines. And, and Pat, do you have a question? I did have a question for Ken. I'm wondering what you are seeing in the way of trends for advances from publishing companies to authors. Uh, can anybody see, everybody see what's going on here? Uh, down. For, for it's down, down. Podcast, down. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry to interrupt. Right. Is it a podcast? Ken was, Ken was pointing way down in case you're listening. Thumbs down. Thumbs down. Yeah. <laughs> Steadily going down. Um, so, um, so there are big advances. A lot of times we read about them in the in the news, news that um, maybe an unknown uh, novelist, for example, has gotten a million dollars or five million dollars or whatever. Um, it's lost on me what, what the business model is there to a great extent, because I don't, I don't really know how it pays off unless they're right. Um, Publishers, uh, I deal mostly with uh, business uh, experts, 
And business books, by and large, the publisher tends to know that you're doing it because you want it as uh, a couple of things, a credibility tool for yourself and also uh, a way of um, leveraging uh, sales so that you you uh, earn money uh, through either speaking fees or, or uh, client uh, consulting uh, fees and that kind of thing. So they know that. So therefore, they don't offer you that much. Um, they, they certainly don't offer you the kind of money that's going to allow you to take a sabbatical for three or four or five months and uh, uh, just work on the book. They're not going to do that. They, they know that you're, you're willing to work on weekends and at nights and things, mornings and things like that. So, uh, so the trend really has been down. Now, having said that, um, you know, I've had situations with some McGraw Hill and others where uh, there have been very good deals. Uh, Twenty thousand dollar advances and um, uh, fifteen thousand and seventeen and like that. So that's kind of the range that I've seen is the top range, except for if you go higher, the mega range when you already have this platform and people really, you're really well known. It's your household name, and then 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 there you're going to be able to command a. That, I mean, that's the irony of this whole thing is that if you don't need the money and if you don't need the publicity, you know, it just comes to you, you're the person that the publisher will invest in. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, it, it's, uh, yeah, if there's any trend I can say I've seen over the years, it's, it's up the downward one. And just one more question related to that. And by the way, I'm Pat Iyer, an editor and a ghostwriter and author of 59 books, both traditional and self-published. If we look at that grim statistic of 93% of the books don't sell more than a thousand copies and the publisher has given an advance and that book does not sell, is yeah. the author required to return any of those funds to the publisher? Yeah, oh, so that's, that's a good question. Um, well, the answer, is, the answer is technically yes, but traditionally, no. Um, it is an advance. It's called that. It's not a called a fee. It's an advance. Um, and um, uh, in in the tradition of book publishing, when a book doesn't sell, which is most of them, they don't. The publishers don't run around trying to get that money back. Uh, it's all of you spent, and it, you know it, it might be. It might only be you know. $5,000 or $500 or something like that. So the answer is really no. It's uh, it's not that part's something you don't have to worry about. <laughs> you get away scot-free <laughs> if um, if the book doesn't sell. You know, Ken, I'm curious. You know, I'm a big reader of the Wall Street Journal uh, book review section on Saturdays and their bestseller lists and the Sunday New York Times book yeah. reviews and whatever. And yeah. Every once in a while, in fact, more than every once in a while, some unknown author writes a book that is suddenly getting a ton of publicity and they have no platform and they make it big. And I'm just curious, how, how does that happen? How do they find that diamond in the rough? Nobody knows. That's, that's, <laughs> that's, that's weird. I'm sorry, it's true. Now, I, I'm talking to you from Concord, Massachusetts. Uh, about 150, 160 years ago here, we had some well-known authors, uh, names like Ralph Waldo Emerson, Henry David Thoreau, and Louisa May Alcott. Henry David Thoreau's work, uh, Walden, and uh, well, primarily Walden, there's a few other books that he did, but I think that one, that one still sells like crazy even now. It's 150 years after his death. Um, but when he was alive, he wrote a, a, a book before that that really didn't sell at all. In fact, it was the, the publisher uh, stopped printing it and, uh, and sold it back to Henry uh, at, at, a, at cheap, like 20 cents a book or something like that, 200 volumes. But then he wrote Walden, and Walden sold some, some books, it sold some copies, but it wasn't a runaway bestseller. So when he died, he, he never knew it to be a book that was really selling that much. Um, Louisa May Alcott, on the other hand, was um, 
when she wrote Little Women, she already had written a couple of, of uh, other types of uh, mystery novels and things. And she didn't had never never uh, written a, a children's book. She didn't even want to write it. Her publisher asked her if she'd be willing to, and she grudgingly said yes. The book came out and was a runaway blockbuster bestseller, like you can't believe. And um, and it's still and look, we just had a movie and like the fourth or fifth uh, movie of uh, a rendition of uh, Little Women, just uh, I guess last year or two years ago. Um, why is that? I mean, who could have predicted that? And that's why I said earlier, sometimes you'll hear about these, uh, these incredible deals of uh, $500,000 or a million dollars to an unknown novelist. And then you don't hear anything again, because a lot of times they fall flat. Uh, so it's luck. It's L-U-C-K. And uh, the, the publisher to make a taking a gamble and uh, maybe it'll pay off and maybe it won't. But most of the time, it doesn't pay off. Interesting. You know, as I said, I'm a big I'm a reader of the Wall Street Journal bestseller list, especially the business books. And uh, a person I know very well, who has a very big reputation, teaches at a top business school, came out with a book a few weeks ago, and it, it reached the bestseller list uh, for one week, and then a second week, and then it dropped off. And I'm guessing... Mm -hmm. And you could uh, that very simply that all of her followers bought the book the first week, the second week, it, it spurred the sales. And after that, there was nothing. I'm sure she sold enough copies to make her publisher happy and to make herself happy. But it, the book didn't have legs. And I, I, I'm a member of the National Speakers Association. There are a number of people who are true thought leaders there who've written books that are really, really great books, but they don't appear on the bestseller list. They don't seem to have the legs that say an Adam Grant book does or a Patrick Leoncioni. I can never pronounce his name. I apologize. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. or, or, or the the Ken Blanchard books, you know, the true bestsellers that have legs for years and years. Why do those books succeed? What can what what lessons can we take from an Adam Grant book and apply it to uh, the people listening on on our call? Well, I'm, I'm going to use Ken Blanchard. I'm going to tell you a story about Ken Blanchard. He wrote the One Minute Manager, didn't he? He did, and 60 other books. Yeah. So here's the thing. Remember I told you that uh, uh, my uh, uh, agent, Mike, uh, took me under his wing and, and, and brought me around New York City and all the publishing houses? Mm -hmm. We had a um, lunch with a publisher, an editor, from Morrow which was a, a big publishing house back then. I don't, I think it's maybe part of Random House now, whatever, but it was his own, its own publishing house. And we were having lunch, the three of us. And this uh, editor, whose name I forget at this point, told me that he was responsible for the one minute manager. But he said, it took some doing to um, get his colleagues to believe that this was a book that would sell. And he said, frankly, he didn't really believe it too much. He thought it was an interesting book, but there's hardly any words in it. <laughs> it's probably like a 500 words or something in the whole thing, if that. And, um, and, they, and they actually passed uh, the proposal, or maybe it was the manuscript around, and they were all laughing at it. <laughs> but for some reason, they decided to take a chance on it. And, there, and, it, and it took off. Who knows why? That's why I say, uh, I bring us back to Louisa May Alcott. Who knows why? Um, it's really as L-U-C-K, I'm telling you. There's nothing okay. more. There's, there's, if there was a formula, then somebody, like some publisher or whatever, would be, you know, it, it would be guaranteed book after book after book. But there's no formula like that that works. You know, that, that's really funny. You know, there, there's a famous uh, NSA speaker who just recently passed, Jeannie Robertson, wonderful, wonderful person. Uh, she put out hundreds and hundreds of videos on, on YouTube, and one of them went viral. And everyone at the NSA yeah. conference said, Jeannie, tell us, how did it go viral? How did you make that, 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 that one go viral? And she said, I put out hundreds of videos on YouTube that hadn't gone viral. Yeah, so, exactly. If she knew what works. <laughs> The other ones would have gone viral as well because they're all marvelous. She's a great storyteller. Right, right, um, right. As we close up here, Ken, I'm wondering, what do you see as trends in book writing? I'm talking about lengths of books, uh, pictures in books, writing styles for books. 
and other things that will appeal now to a generation that seems to have absolutely no patience and no uh, ability to sit down and read long 40, 60, 80,000 word books anymore. What do you see as the future? Well, I, I have to take issue with your premise. Mm -hmm. I've got a, I got a, a 28 year old daughter um, who is a graduate of Yale and uh, kept in, uh, in touch with her friends from Yale and uh, has a boyfriend that she met at Yale. And um, uh, she prefers to, to read books in the traditional way. And uh, I, I, I think about um, who I've seen over the years since eBooks, for example, uh, came in. And um, as many, I, I see people my age uh, as much as uh, younger people. Um, I don't really see any, any big trends except to say, uh, there was the, the first thought I have when I hear that question is, well, there was a trend about, I don't know, 10 years ago uh, for uh, smaller books and shorter books and this and that, because 10, 20 years ago, I was hearing that um, books get bought, they get put up on the on their shelf, on the bookshelf, and they don't actually get read. Um, so uh, I, I, I think that, uh, I, oh, the, what I was saying was that the trend of the shorter book, I don't see that anymore. I don't see that happening. Um, well, you can't, you can't really see, uh, only Dan can see this, but I'm holding up a copy of what you might say is a, a regular sized book. I mean, it's maybe 250 pages and um, it's all, that's always been a, a regular sized book. And I think it still is. So I think that the, I also um, don't like to suggest that there's something that somebody can do that's going to um, make it uh, more likely that their book is accepted by a publisher and becomes a best uh, becomes a big seller or a bestseller or whatever. I think that the the key continues to be what's your passion, what's your concept, what's what is it that you know about, what is it that you feel uh, you could dedicate yourself to writing a book. And Dan, you've you've written a number of books. And you know what it's like to write a book. It's not something you just sort of dash dash through. So people need to know that they, it's a big commitment to write a book and they should go with something that makes sense to them. Um, and, and you take your chances. Everybody takes their chances. I, I really don't think trends are things that it really exist. It, not for very long anyway, fads, but not trends. I think that's a great inspirational way to close our conversations today. Ken, why don't you tell us how people can get in touch with you and we'll sign off. Sure. Well, just uh, send me an email at Ken at thoughtleading.com. That's thought leading, like in, like in thought leadership, only with an ING, thoughtleading.com. And one thing I would say is that uh, I have a book uh, that was published by McGraw-Hill. <laughs> called The Expert's Edge, and it talks all about uh, not only things we talked about here, but uh, other aspects of becoming a business thought leader. And uh, I have a free uh, digital version, condensed digital version of the book, if anyone would like it. All they have to do is just ask uh, Ken Lazat, uh, or not, not Ken Lazat, just Ken at thoughtleading.com. Great. Thank you for being with us today, and thanks, everyone, for listening. Thank you, Dan. And thanks. We have lots of other videos on YouTube. Please subscribe and listen to another video. We have new ones every single week. Thanks and good luck with your books. Thank you for listening to the Write Your Book in a Flash podcast with Dan Janelle, the only podcast that shows you exactly how people just like you have built their businesses by writing a book. If you'd like to write your book but don't know where to start, you can find great information at writeyourbookinaflash.com. If you're ready to take your next step to write the book that can transform your business, I invite you to schedule a free, no obligation consulting call with me by going to writeyourbookinaflash.com. We'll be back next week with another insightful interview to help you become a top business leader.